uh, I would like to thank the organizers for having me here and it's going to be a real pleasure to present to you the latest data on a disease which I consider as very ugly in an aging population. And in fact, during the trials, we had many patients who would, who would have loved to participate, but who couldn't because they already had a, a SOSA episode. So they told me how bad it is maybe. So let's start off uh, with my conflict of interest. Uh, as everybody else, I'm giving talks for companies, as you see here, and I'm receiving honoraria for conducting clinical trials. I've just mentioned to you that SOSTA can be a very ugly disease. It's not just, as Martin Wilde says, a, um, one of the diseases of the elderly. It may be a disease, especially if you have a SOSTA episode here in your trigeminus uh, up there. It may, be, it may lead to, to severe headaches, which is uh, persistent. And actually, there are some data telling, you, telling us that people actually commit suicide because of this painful um, SOSTA episode up there. Um, so it's uh, really something which may um, reduce the quality of life in these people. All of us will get older, and if you look at the incidence of Soster, it is also increasing with age. And there are numerous studies from various parts of the world telling us that with increasing age, as of 50 onwards, the risk for Soster increases. And in fact, uh, as we're getting older, so... Um, there are some estimates that one third of the population eventually, at least in the industrialized world, will eventually come down with Soster and uh, will enjoy this lovely disease, which is now preventable. I've uh, picked up some data from France. As we are in France, uh, you see the same pattern here for France, an increasing rate of Soster with age and also increasing number with age for, for the post-Soster neuralgia, which is the painful uh, residual damage uh, as or complication from, from Soster. To give you some figures, for Germany, we, we um, estimate that we have some 400,000 cases of Soster per year. So that is the burden which we have to reduce. This is uh, also a burden for our pain uh, doctors who are helping, who are trying to help these patients um, if they come down with uh, the post-Soster neuralgia. So some of the points about Soster, um, there's some, some indication or at least some, suspect, uh, some suspicion that uh, the increase in Soster may be related to the varicella vaccination program. At least that is something we could speculate. However, um, if you look at the increase in Soster in the industrialized world, even in countries which now have a varicella program, the fact is that uh, the incidence of Soster was already increasing before the varicella vaccination program started. So whether they are really linked is quite unclear. One thing is quite clear, we have a reduced exposure to varicella Soster. We have a different attitude uh, in the, in the, 19, in the uh, up to the 1980s. Uh, when you had a, a kid with, uh, with a chicken pox in your neighborhood, you sent your kids there to get immunized. Uh, that is something which we don't do anymore, so there is a reduced exposure to varicella soster virus. And there are some old anecdotal data telling us that pediatricians never came down with soster simply because they had been re-exposed very often during their work life. Um, one thing is also quite clear, we have more immune compromised patients that may also lead to an increase in soster. And we have some demographic changes which are quite uh, striking. We have a decreasing percentage of women with more than one child, child and we have a decreasing number of children per woman in our industrialized countries. That is also a reason why there's little or less um, exposure to varicella. We have more single parent families and also depending on where you're working, a decreasing contact of grandparents with uh, grandchildren, which may also uh, avoid the booster, the natural booster. So there are certain several things which, which we have to take into consideration when looking at the reason why we have an increase in Soster in our communities. Soster, as you all know, is a reactivation of the varicella Soster virus, which will remain in our ganglia once the initial primary infection takes place. And there, the virus li lies dormant for many years before it's reactivated, causing the typical clinical signs of Soster. What, why is Soster painful? What does Soster do? And th these, I think, are very impressive pictures showing us a neuron up here, which is um, degenerated by Soster. You see the varicella Soster um, viruses, the particles in the neurons. 
And if you look at the histological picture, you see here surviving um, nerve cells in a dorsal root ganglion, and here the scarring. So if you see this destruction in the ganglion, it's quite understandable why we have pain. I mean, if you have no more electron, uh, electrical uh, contact through your ganglions, it's quite clear that SOSTA will result in consistent pain. So what is our understanding of the immunology? Well, we have our primary, um, primary infection. From there, the, um, the virus will remain latent, um, and per probably there are reactivations, periodical reactivations, which do not lead to a disease. And once your immune system fades or wanes, uh, immunosenescence, we've just learned about that this morning, um, you are prone to get a reactivation which leads to soster. So if you want to actively prevent soster, we have to do something about that situation here. We have to give a natural, we have to give a booster to boost the immune system uh, to prevent uh, the reactivation of varicella soster virus. The correlate here is not quite clear at the moment uh, what we really, what is the threshold value that is, as for many other viral infections, it is unclear. We have two licensed vaccines, at least generally speaking. We have the life attenuated uh, vaccine, which is indicated for, um, for individuals above the age of 50, was first licensed in 2006. It's a one-dose schedule. And uh, there are some countries with ha we, uh, which do have an quite good experience in using this vaccine. And as the new vaccine, as Martin Wilde already mentioned to you, we've got the herpes zoster subunit vaccine. It is an uh, adjuvanted subunit vaccine combining the uh, glycoprotein E, recombinant glycoprotein E, uh, which is adjuvanted with an um, adjuvant system called ASO1, which is a combination of MPL and um, saponin, which forms a lipid, uh, uh, sorry, which forms a liposome, which uh, appears to be very, very immunogenic. It's given as a two-dose schedule. Currently, it's 0-2 but uh, we can expect also a vaccination schedule zero up to six months for the second dose. It was first licensed in Canada in September and in the US in October, and uh, EMA should um, send out the letter with a positive opinion at the end of next week. So basically we will probably have the registration by January next year. What is the current status of, um, of SOSTA vaccination? In I've picked out a few countries as an example. We have a recommendation in the UK, 70 to 79, sorry, 70 to 79. We have Canada, 60 plus, France, 65 plus 74, uh, to 74, Austria, 50 plus, um, Saxonia, which is a federal state in Germany, um, 50 plus, and Germany does not have a general recommendation yet. Uh, looking at the US data, we have uh, roughly 31% uptake in the over 60 years old, which I think for an elderly population is quite good. 31%, um, if I think of pneumococcal um, vaccination in Germany, I think we are lower than 10%, so 31% is a major achievement. And that is something which is really uh, well, quite worth to mention. So just a few data on the new vaccine. I'm, I'm not sure whether everybody has seen these, these data so far. It was a combination of two trials, uh, SOE50, SOE70. Um, two doses were administered. Total population was roughly 30,000 subjects. It was a, com a placebo control trial. And the endpoint was SOSTER incidence or SOSTER occurrence, and the occurrence or the prevention of post-SOSTER neuralgia. Uh, the trial had been going on for four years, and um, I remember when we had a telephone conference in December 2015 and were exposed to the data that there was complete silence on the phone because everybody was just knocked out from the data <laughs> as we were not expecting this, these results to be like that. And you can see the results here. <coughs> Overall, uh, we have a 97.2% um, efficacy against uh, the prevention of soster and throughout the age groups. So there is no difference up to the age of 70 plus, which is for, an, for, for a vaccine 
in elderly, which is, I think, very spectacular. I've, I can't think of any other vaccine which induces such a high rate of uh, prevention than the new vaccine. So this is really outstanding. The same applies to um, prevention of uh, postosteroneuralgia. Here it was 91% in the uh, population 50 plus and 88.8% .8 in the population 70 plus, which look, once again, looking at the burden of disease in our countries, I mean, you can do a lot of good if you can prevent that. I think that is really excellent news for our elderly population. And since I'm gonna be an elderly next year as well, it's, uh, <laughs> it's um, quite promising to get this vaccine next year. So uh, we had another vaccine already on the market in the US at least and in parts of Europe. And uh, this is a graph showing you the, the, the waning of protection over time for the life attenuated vaccine. So roughly after 10 years, there is very little protection left. And this is the model, uh, this is the results of the SOE 50 and SOE 70 trial for four years. And you see it's a completely different kinetic. Um, that is one of the major differences between the two vaccines. And also if you look at the um, immune responses in terms of CD4 results, of CD4 values, there is a constant um, line. There is almost no waning over the four years and over the age groups in the, um, in the Soster subunit vaccine compared to the waning in the life attenuated vaccine. So there is a really a striking difference which can be seen from the data of the two vaccines. I have to point out that this is not a comparative trial, but these are data which were pulled together by, by, AC, by ACIP in the US um, and uh, presented at the ACIP meeting. Um, we were, we were um, involved in a trial, in a phase two trial, which started in 2007, and these are the nine years follow-up data of this vaccine, and you see that after the initial slow decline in CD4 uh, values, um, there is no more waning. And we just have collected the 10 years data this year, and, uh, and for nine years, all through the numbers are very small, uh, we can demonstrate a very high efficacy um, over time. And none of these patients did have an episode of Soster, but measuring the CD4 levels gave us quite a good um, good indication that they are still protected. And I think that is something we have to, have to um, keep in mind that giving two doses will give you a very long time of protection. And that is something which I think is very, um, very um, hopeful for the elderly. So uh, next point is what to do with uh, those who had previously been vaccinated with the life attenuated vaccine. Um, this does not apply to Germany because we didn't vaccinate almost anybody. This applies to the UK, uh, France, um, Canada, and US. I hope I didn't forget any other big market so far. But uh, what did they do? They looked at individuals who had received the life attenuated vaccine um, more than five years ago and um, compared them with another arm giving the new uh, life attenuated, uh, sorry, the, the new um, subunit vaccine. Follow-up time was um, just three months for that initial data, which is one month after the third dose. And what were the results? And I think that is also very spectacular. Here in orange, you have those individuals with a previous life attenuated Zoster vaccine more than five years from the initial vaccination. In pink, you've got those who have not, not received any Soster vaccine so far. And here you see the results one month after the second dose. And you see that both arms, those who have previously been vaccinated with the life attenuated Soster vaccine and the initial naive, well, naive is not a good word because they're all seropositive. So yeah, I think we have to find another uh, expression for that. But at least those who have not been vaccinated with the Soster vaccine before, they came up to the same um, CD4 levels. And the, these levels were comparable with the results from the SOE50 trial. So basically, they benefit. And the conclusion which was drawn from ACIP when they saw these data is, well, we gotta do something about the patients or the individuals who have previously been vaccinated with life attenuated vaccine. Because, I mean, they benefit, definitely. And once again, we're talking about a 31% 
uptake in the US, so this is a sub great number of people you have to vaccinate. That's why it was, it was important to do this trial. Um, ACIP, like any other um, vaccine recommending body, um, looks very carefully at all the data which are available. And this is a, a table taken from the last ACIP meeting in June this year, and you see everywhere um, efficacy, uh, post neuralgia, duration of protection, severe adverse event, you have excellent data. The only little, little, well, point which is worth mentioning is it's painful once you're vaccinated. It's as painful as tetanus. I mean, you survive tetanus vaccination usually. At least your arm might get a little bit red and swollen. But these were the only mm, important point to to mention during the vaccine trials that it's a painful vaccination. You have to inform the patient that the arm might be a little bit red and sore and you've got some induration in the arm, which is transient after two, three days, it's usually gone. But nothing else was really relevant in these, um, in these clinical trials. So what came to a surprise to us, um, ACIP prepared everything for the registration of FDA, which is which has not happened before, at least I can't recall that something like this happened before. So in, uh, my, in, June two in June 2012, ACIP prepared everything for the registration, and the registration came, and the same day, the uh, ACIP changed the recommendation, the current recommendation in the US, and it said, ACIP recommends Shingrix, sorry, the subunit vaccine, I shouldn't mention any names, um, recommends the subunit vaccine for the prevention of herpes zoster and related complications for immune competent adults age 50 plus and adults who previously received zoster vax or the life vaccine. And the committee voted that Shingrix is preferred over zoster vax for the prevention of zoster and related complications. Not only that they recommend the new vaccine, they also um, recommend it preferable, which is also something which is unusual for, uh, for a vaccine recommending body. So here we are with this new vaccine. I think it's up to the um, various countries to adopt uh, a recommendation and to think of what they have brief previously recommended, especially UK will have to do something about it uh, this as well, I presume. Um, and one of the points which is also quite important to mention, you can vaccinate, you can co-administer that new vaccine. Uh, here we've done a trial with, uh, with flu, tetravalent flu. There is no um, influence of combining the two vaccines, um, whether given at the same time or independently. Um, the same data will be uh, available in the next couple of months with uh, uh, conjugated pneumococcal vaccine and also with polysaccharide vaccine. So basically, it's a, it's a vac vaccine which can be given as a co-administrative, in a co-administrative schedule in the elderly, 50 or 60 plus, depending on your national recommendations. So let me conclude to stay within my, five, my 20 minutes. It is a milestone. I think I pointed to, out to you that it's, it's the first vaccine in an elderly population with a very, very high efficacy. That is amazing. Um, and we have something very good for the prevention of an infectious disease in an aging population. Um, the new vaccine will substantially reduce the burden of disease, improve the quality of life in the elderly, will reduce costs to the healthcare system, and national, um, current national Soster uh, vaccine recommendations will have to be updated once the vaccine is uh, licensed everywhere. Thank you very much.